I'm glad that you're all here this morning. I believe God has some amazing things for every one of us. We're still in our sermon series on the book of Mark. Um, today we'll be talking about a story that uh, is really one of my favorites. Maybe you're familiar with it if you've been in your Bible any time at all. It's about the woman with the issue of blood and also Jairus' daughter. Uh, we're actually in a section of Scripture where we're looking at four powerful miracles that Jesus performed. We've already covered two. Remember we talked about how he calmed the storm? He said three words, peace be still, the storm was calm. Uh, last week we talked about Jesus casting demons out of the demoniac. Well, today we're going to look at two more uh, powerful miracles. And when you add all these miracles together, you've got four powerful miracles that show us the awesome power that Jesus has really over everything. The first one, he has power over nature. He has power over Satan. He has power over every demon from hell. He has power over sickness and disease, and he even has power over death. That's a lot of power, to have power over death. How many of you have ever been out doing something and you got distracted? Anybody? We get distracted all the time. Some of you are distracted right now, right? <laughs> How many of you have ever been doing something and you found yourself distracted and started doing something else? It happens to me all the time. Even going out to the barn, I'll go out there to feed and water the horses, and I'll see that the water trough is empty, and I'll get out the hose, and I'll start filling up the uh, water trough. That takes a while, so I'll go into the barn, and I'll see something else that needs to be done, and then uh, after a while, I remember the water. That after a while is usually the next day. When, when Cheryl looks out the window, she's, oh my gosh, we've got some oceanfront property. This is amazing. What she does, she usually gets out her camera right then and there, takes a picture of it, her, her phone, takes a picture of it, sends it to her brother Chris in Texas. He loves to see that. He makes fun of me all the time. She actually does too. But really to make matters worse, a friend of ours, Mike Bergner, he had heard about the water issue. And uh, he bought me a float that fits on, fits on your tank that will automatically shut it off. Well, needless, needless to say, I got distracted before I got the thing on. I'm just saying. Well, that's what happens in our story today, not Jesus filling up a water trough, but Jesus getting distracted. Jesus is on his way to heal someone, and his, his attention gets diverted to go heal someone else. And you've got to think of the season Jesus is, uh, is in. His popularity is growing by the day. Everybody's coming from everywhere. Everybody's coming from all over Israel, outside of Israel, basically chasing him down everywhere he went. He's teaching them, he's preaching to them, he's healing them. He's really like a modern-day rock star or celebrity everywhere he goes. And you might think, wow, that's a mark of success to be that popular. Yes and no. Mark, in his gospel, lets us know how that affected Jesus. He not only was being attacked every day, every day by the religious leaders, the religious elite, there were so many days that he was worn out and exhausted from all the people and their demands that they put on him, pressing in him, on him from all sides, wanting to get something from Jesus. So to get rest and to recharge his batteries, you know what he had to do? He had to get away from everybody sometimes. Sometimes he just got away with him and his disciples, but many times he totally got away. Sometimes he had to get in a boat because the crowds were almost crushing him. So we're gonna, we pick up last week's story from when Jesus uh, delivered the demoniac of all those demons. Do you remember what happened to those demons? Jesus sent them into a herd of pigs. He sent them into that herd of pigs. They dove off, took a swine dive off a cliff, and they died. Well, the townspeople see this happening. and They're not happy with Jesus at all. They're upset. They reject Jesus, don't want to have anything to do with him, and they send him on his way. That's where I want to pick up our story today, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake. Now he's coming back from the land of the Gerasenes back to Capernaum. It says, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. I want to stop here because Jairus immediately takes the greatest form of humility I think you could take is to bow down before Jesus. And listen to what he says in verse 23. He pleaded earnestly with him, or with Jesus, saying, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. 
you might not have caught it, but Jairus isn't just anybody. He's a very important man. He's a ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. He's the highest ruling authority, religious authority in Capernaum. And most likely, he's a Pharisee. And Pharisees, without a doubt, were the notorious enemies of Jesus. So I think it's interesting that a man of this standing, of his status, of his position in the community, I mean religious community, knowing the animosity between his group of guys and Jesus, I think it's kind of amazing that he would actually come to Jesus and ask Jesus to perform a miracle and heal his daughter. You know what you would have to do in order to be able to do that? You would have to let go of your prejudices, right? You'd have to uh, overcome your pride. You'd have to overcome that animosity. But you've got to remember, this guy is desperate. His little girl, the light of his life is on her deathbed. When you're desperate, how many know that you can do some desperate things? When you're desperate, this guy's desperate. And when you're desperate, you're more prone to overcome your biases. You're more prone to overcome your prejudices. He came to Jesus and he begged Jesus. Listen to what he said. My little daughter is dying. Luke's gospel records that she's 12 years old. Remember that number. It's going to come up in a few more verses yet. She's not such a little girl when, she thinks, when you think of her as 12 years old, but I guarantee you she's daddy's little girl. And when you think about this scene, it's a heartbreaker. And I would imagine to every parent in this room today, you would understand where Jairus is coming from. He goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, please come. And put your hands on her so that she will be healed. Then the next word, notice what it is, and live. That means she's in dire straits. She's in trouble. He knows this is a life and death situation. And it's amazing that he exercises not just faith in Jesus, extreme faith in Jesus. You know, I don't know how you come to know the Lord. But I know a whole lot of people that have come to know the Lord in their worst, most trying, lowest, most difficult, and desperate times in their life. Amen? Many of us came to the Lord in our lowest times of our life. And I think a whole lot of that is because when people are suffering, when people are desperate, when people are hurting or a loved one is hurting, when you're up against an impossible situation, you're a whole lot more likely to come to Jesus. If it's not that bad of a situation, a lot of times we'll go out there and we'll exhaust every other avenue we can find, and then we'll pray, right? I mean, so many people, we've heard this, I guess now the only thing we have left to do. I'm not against uh, looking for avenues, but how many know the first thing you should do in any situation is pray? Take it before Almighty God. But we know that when something like this happens and things don't get better, people people often call upon God. That's why C.S. Lewis, a great man of God, said this. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You know why that is? Because pain gets people's attention. Suffering gets people's attention. So Jairus comes to Jesus, not out of love. He comes to Jesus out of flat-out need. He's in, desperate, in a desperate situation. And it was this desperation that he was trying to grasp on to, uh, to hold on to any glimpse of hope that he could find. So Jesus agrees to go see Jairus' daughter. Look at verse 24. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. I'm, imagine, I'm imagining this crowd is getting more excited by the minute, being with Jesus, waiting to see what he's going to do next. They keep pressing in closer uh, and closer to Jesus. And I would imagine as they're pressing in closer and closer to Jesus, Jairus is getting more and more irritated because he's thinking, guys, get out of the way. We're in a hurry right now. We've got to get to my house to heal my daughter. Now, actually, we're going to meet up with the second miracle in our story, even before the first miracle happens, and it's about a woman whose name isn't even mentioned in the Bible. Unlike Jairus, he gets top billing. His name gets mentioned right away, but listen to what her story is. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Think about it. This woman has three problems. She's got a severe medical problem to start with, right? She's had this issue of blood for 12 years. There's that number again. Think about it. She's had this issue, this sickness, for as long as Jairus' daughter has actually been alive. She's went to all sorts of doctors in desperation, and I'm guessing they probably knew they couldn't help her, but they took advantage of her suffering. 
They took advantage of her desperation, which led her to her second problem, a financial problem. Because if you remember what it said in the story, she spent every dime that she had on doctors, trying to find a cure, trying to get better, which leads us to our last problem. She has a religious problem. If you go back to the Old Testament book of Leviticus, the book of laws, in the Old Testament it says that a woman that would have had this kind of issue would have, de- would have been deemed unclean. Do you know what that means? That was a big deal back then. If you were declared unclean, you couldn't go to the temple or the synagogue to worship. You couldn't worship with your Jewish community. So think about this. This woman has several problems going on. Her conditions not only left her bleeding, bankrupt, and actually getting worse, not better. She was ostracized by her own community. She's lonely. She's broken down. She's abandoned. I'm saying she's just like Jairus. She's desperate. But it says that she came into the crowd And I have to think that this woman, because the crowd was pressing in all around Jesus, there were hundreds of people, I have to imagine that she came fighting her way to get to Jesus. And I would imagine that she knew when Jesus touched people, they were healed. Think outside the box for just a minute. I'm guessing she might have been thinking, wait a minute, when Jesus touches people, they're healed. I wonder if that works in reverse. I wonder if people touch Jesus, if they would be healed. So all of a sudden, faith starts to rise up within her, and she thinks to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch his robe, hey, this whole thing is gone. I'm healed, I'm made whole. It says she stretched out her hand, and then something interesting happens. Look at verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Can you imagine the joy in this woman's heart to realize that she's healed? To realize after 12 years of suffering with the situation she had, she's finally free. I'm imagining she's jumping for joy. I would imagine she's celebrating, and then Jesus stops. He has something to say. Look at verse 30. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? So Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. The King James Version says that he felt virtue go out of his body. It's as if someone had actually took a hold and had access to his kingdom power through their desperate situation, their desperate faith. And that's exactly what happened. And Jesus wasn't about to ignore it. And I will say this, this is the first clue that we have about what it cost Jesus to heal people, to minister to people. It really did cost him something. No wonder he was physically exhausted by the end of the day. It cost him something because literal power was going out from his body, going out from his life. Needless to say, it was a demanding ministry for sure. And Jesus asked, who touched my clothes? Listen to his disciples' response. You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and you can ask, who touched me? It's like, really, Jesus? Give me a break. There are hundreds of people that are touching you all around you. What are you talking about? Well, I can understand their question. But they didn't know that Jesus was well aware and and could tell the total difference between somebody randomly bumping against, against him in a crowd and someone who touched him in faith. He knew the difference. His body knew the difference. It was totally different. When Jesus said, who touched my clothes? He knew who touched his clothes. He knows everything. He knew who touched his clothes. You know what he was trying to do, I think? I think he was trying to draw this woman out because he wanted to deal with her out in the public. He wanted to deal with her out in the open. Look at verse 32. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. This tells me a little time is lapsing. Maybe the woman's back there getting enough courage to go uh, to Jesus, tell him what happened. And in verse 33, she must have mustered that courage because look what she says. Then the woman... Look what it says. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Sound familiar? Didn't Jairus do that a few verses ago? She came and fell at his feet. This tells me it doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter how much power you have or don't have, what position you have or don't have. When you come before Jesus Christ, we need to take on a, a position of humility and reverence. Amen? We ought to come before Jesus every time we come before him with humility and reverence. 
Jesus came for those that have a name, and he came for those that are filled with shame. Amen? Those that have a name that are recognized and those that aren't. And it says she comes trembling with fear and told him the whole truth. You know this woman has to be uh, 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 scared to death, intimidated at this moment. She's probably wondering if Jesus is mad at her for touching him. She's probably thinking, is he going to be so angry with me that he's going to take away my healing? You know what this tells me? It tells me this woman, yeah, she knew about Jesus' power, but she didn't know about his kindness and his mercy. I love verse 34. Listen to Jesus' response. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I love that he calls her daughter. Do you realize this is the only time in the Gospels that he calls anyone daughter? And I believe God is trying to show us something. More than just a healing took place here. This woman was not only healed, I believe she was redeemed. I believe she was actually saved. Look at verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Let those words sink in for just a minute, especially you as parents. That would be the worst set of words you could have ever heard in your life. Amen? It would have been terrible, so final. And I bet Jairus is thinking, wow, if Jesus just hadn't have been distracted, he would have came and we'd have made it on time, he'd have healed my daughter. If these crowds of people just wouldn't have been crowded, crowding in, we'd have got there on time. And then he's probably thinking, if Jesus just hadn't healed that woman and came to my daughter's house, she's dying after all, and he knew every second counted, why didn't he come? You know, we might judge Jairus a little bit, but don't we do that a lot of times? We often think when something bad happens, we think, well, God mismanaged my circumstances. It's like God messed up. He didn't. He didn't at all. That's when we have to lean in closer to God, draw closer to Him, reach out in faith and believe that He has a plan, that He has a perfect plan, and His plans are better than our plans. His timing is better than our timing. And when God gets ready to do something, if we keep trusting in him in his own timing, he'll do what needs to be done. And it may not even be what you think needs to be done, but it'll be what needs to be done because he is God. He's above every circumstance or situation. Look at verse 36. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. You know, I'm sure when he looks at Jairus' face, he sees disappointment. He sees dis uh, uh, fear. He sees distress on Jairus' face. And Jesus is thinking, Jairus, you came to me in the first place to get something. And you came to me with faith. So Jesus, being full of compassion, he looks straight at Jairus. And again, he says, don't fear, just believe. It's like he's giving Jairus a command. He's saying, Jairus, wait a minute. You came to me in faith. You believe, believed I could do this. So stop fearing and start believing. Amen? Stop fearing and keep believing. I think somebody, many somebodies in this place, including myself, need to hear that. When you run up against hard times and difficult times that seem impossible, you need to stop fearing. And you need to st keep trusting, keep believing that God has the answer. Do you realize that faith and fear can't live in the same room? They can't live together. They're opposites. One's going to overtake the other. The cure for fear is faith. If you've got fear, you're not really walking in true faith. Because when you have true faith, it's going to remove the fear. They can't live together side by side. Then Jesus, in our story, he carefully picks three of his disciples to go with him because he wants them to see something they're never going to forget. Look at verse 37. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jairus, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. You may not understand this, but in those days, it was their custom to hire professional mourners. Professional mourners to make a lot of noise on behalf of the family. Yeah, Jairus' family would have been there mourning with them, but these mourners were professionals. They would actually be in the house. They would tear their garments as, as their custom. They would wail. They would scream. They would cry. All these things... Uh, to uh, show their mourning, show their respect to the dead. And I love what Jesus does. Verse 39, he went in and said to them, why all the commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, but asleep. He's not saying when you die, your soul is just sleeping. 
There is a doctrine out there that's called soul sleeping that they believe when you die, you actually go into this uh, unconscious state. You unplug for thousands of years maybe until Jesus comes back. Let me tell you, don't believe that doctrine because it's not true. It's not biblical because the Bible discredits that. And it says when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. When you are absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. So you're not out there in limbo. You're in, you're in the presence of God in some form or fashion. So Jesus just used this image of sleep to basically say that what this girl's dealing with is just temporary in the big picture of things. He said one day she's going to be restored like all believers will. But he's not only talking eternally or spiritually here. He's talking naturally because he's saying, I'm about to lift her up. I'm about to raise her up. And while we're on the topic of death, let me say this. Every person will be awakened from their sleep of death one day and face judgment. And if you're a believer, it's then you're going to e enjoy the eternal resurrection in the presence of God forever. But if you're not a believer, if you've re rejected Jesus, you're going to face something that the book of Revelations calls the second death, which is actually worse than death because it's an eternal separation from God. It's also an eternal suffering. So the reason Jesus said she was only sleeping, he was using a metaphor because he says, hey, I'm about to wake her up. I'm about to do a miracle. I'm about to resurrect this little girl. Verse 40, but they laughed at him. These professional mourners, they were experts on death. They had to be. It was their job. They were experts on death. But Luke, in his gospel, clearly states that everyone knew this girl wasn't sleeping. They knew this girl was literally dead. So when Jesus says she's just sleeping, they looked at him and you are ridiculous. That's not what's happening. So what they do, they laughed at him. You know, that shouldn't surprise us as Christ followers, as believers. If you follow Jesus long enough, people are going to make fun of you. You realize that? People are going to laugh at you sometimes, especially in the day and age and the culture we live in. They don't understand our faith. They actually call it faith foolishness. But while people were laughing, what does Jesus do? He kind of clears them out of the room. Listen to the scripture. Verse 40. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha koam, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. Remember, she's 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. How many would have liked to have been in that room that day to see that happen? I would have. I think that would have been so amazing. He says to get up. She opens her eyes. She looks around, sees Jesus and the disciples. She sees her mom and dad there. She gets up then and she starts walking around. Jesus looks at his, her parents and he says, hey, fix her a snack. <laughs> fix her a snack. Get her something to eat. She's been through enough already. I love that. I can imagine everyone else is standing there with their mouths dropped open uh, in amazement. But Jesus, like he always is, is concerned. He's concerned about the welfare of this child. He knows she's well and alive, so he knows she needs something to eat. You know, that makes me appreciate Jesus all the more because he covers every detail that we have. He knows every need that we have, no matter how small it is, how big it is, or how in the middle it is. He knows every situation that we're going through and knows how to supply that need. It's hard for me to imagine what Jairus and his, mother, uh, his wife would have been thinking about this time. Put yourself in that situation. One minute their daughter is dead. Everything looks hopeless. And in the next second, they've got her back again. So what can we learn from these two stories? If you're taking notes, the first one is God has a purpose in our suffering. Do you know that? God has a purpose in our suffering. Suffering can actually be helpful. I didn't say it's going to feel good. I didn't say it's going to be fun. I didn't say it's going to be enjoyable. But I will say it's going to be helpful. How many know that mountain climbers could uh, save a lot of time and energy if they just took a helicopter up to the summit, right? <laughs> Take a helicopter up to the uh, top of the mountain. They're not going to do that because their ultimate goal is conquest, not convenience. Yeah, they want to reach their goal, but they want to do it the hard way in a way that's going to create stamina and character, right? There's a purpose to it. Well, in 1 Peter, Peter tells us there is a purpose to something called trials and tests and troubles. Look what he says in 1 Peter 1, 7. 
These trials have come so that your faith, which is of greater value than gold, even though refined or purified by fire, may be proved genuine. You know, I've seen some believers that have gone through some, through some terrible, terrible times, but come out on the other side of those terrible times, walking closer to Jesus than they ever walked before. Amen. You know why that is? Those trials, those tests, those troubles perfected their faith. Those trials built their faith up. It can also make you humble. It can deflate your arrogant ego sometimes. The Apostle Paul even had to figure this one out. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 7. Therefore, in, o- in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God says, My power, Paul, is made perfect in your weakness. Paul is saying, I've seen so many amazing things that God has done. I've had visions, I've had revelations. But to keep me humble, he allowed. God allowed this thorn in my flesh. He allowed this thorn in my life. Think about Jairus. He humbled himself, right? He fell down on his face before Jesus. And he found his Savior was immediately there waiting to meet every need that he had, especially the one that drove him to this desperate moment, the death of his daughter. So what I'm saying, and I believe God is saying through this message, if you're in desperate times, and maybe you're not right now, maybe you will be tomorrow. But many of us can look back when we were in desperate times. And we saw what keeping our eyes upon Jesus could do. It changed the whole circumstance. It changed everything that we're dealing with because we weren't dealing with it anymore. We gave it to God. When Jairus humbled himself, he found Jesus waiting there. So if you're desperate, you need to realize we don't serve a cruel God this morning. Maybe you came out of a church background where uh, you thought God was up there with a big old stick waiting to hit you when you did something wrong. That's not our God. Oh, he's a stern God. He's a fair God, a just God. But he loves you with so much love. I assure you, he is not a cruel God. He knows about your circumstances. He knows what troubles you're going through, and he loves you. And he knows you're going through the troubles, but guess what? At the end of the day, he's going to use those troubles and turn them around for your good. And he's going to turn them around for his glory. His plan is going to be worked out. The second thing is steer clear from the naysayers. You know, if you're hanging out with people, that crush your faith if you're hanging out with people that keep your faith shallow and weak you're never going to learn to trust God and isn't it amazing that one naysayer can poison an entire group an entire group of people by chipping away at their trust in God you know when I think about these naysayers they're not only negative they're dangerous they're not only negative they're poisonous and dangerous to our soul you know what they feed on our fear they feed on our doubt Some of us have literally been disabled by the opinions of other people. Just what other people thought. So I will say this. When you give more weight to the opinions of others than you do God's opinion, guess what? You're going to end up standing on the sideline when God really wants you in the game. You're going to stay locked up in your own self-made prison of doubt and fear. Because opinions, if you listen to the opinions of people, they're going to fail you. The opinions are going to lock you up and they're going to sidetrack you from God's purpose and God's plan. And remember this, Jesus put these doubters, these professional mourners out of the room that laughed at him before he turns Jairus' desperation into joy. Which brings me to my third point. When you receive bad news, you know what you should do? Keep walking with God. No matter how bad that bad news is, keep walking with God. You know, after this woman is healed of this 12-year bleeding issue, Word comes from Jairus' home. Don't bother the master. Your little, uh, your daughter is already dead. Nobody would want to hear that. But Jesus comes to Jairus, and he says, don't lose hope, don't give up, don't quit. He says, don't be afraid, just believe. You know, our first tendency is when we uh, run into hard times, we want to fear. We want to start doubting. That's why Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. Fear says, uh, fear says, uh, give up, right? Fear says, give up. Faith says, keep walking. Fear says, there's no way. Faith says, just believe. Just keep trusting in God. Just keep walking with God. Amen? As you walk through your trials and your tests, because God is there with you every step of the way. He's there to console you. He's there to comfort you. 
He's there to give you the peace and the strength that you need, to give, your, give you the counseling that you need if you'll just keep walking with God. If you give up and quit, you're going to fail. But if you keep walking with God, He won't fail. There's a popular saying, and I love it. I use it many times. Um, a promise made is not a promise denied. A promise delayed is not a promise denied. Get that? A promise delayed is not a promise denied. Just because you haven't seen God answer a prayer yet, just because you haven't seen Him fulfill a promise that you think you've received out of His Word, doesn't mean He's not working, right? He's working behind the scenes. You may not see it, but I guarantee you He's working on it. And again, it's not in our timing. It's in His timing. I believe with all of my heart that delays are part of God's grand design. And I actually believe that interruptions are part of God's appointments for us. Sometimes we need to be interrupted along the way just so that God's timing can be worked out. But the truth is we just need to keep walking with God. Keep walking in faith. Amen? Because how many have given up? Midstream, you gave up. But how many are grateful to a God that lets you pick it up again? He lets you get going again. He didn't give up on you. We may have given up on Him. But so many times of my life when I gave up on Him, after He was still there and I felt His presence, God says, it's time to get up and go again. For somebody in this room, you need to hear that. It's time to get up and go again. It's time to start walking with God. It's it's time to stop fearing and start believing. Amen. Could you stand to your feet? We just need to keep walking with Jesus in faith. I want to invite anyone that... uh, needs uh, additional prayer at the end of the service uh, you can actually come up as I'm closing prayer Pam and Carmen will be down here and I'll be here to agree with you in faith uh, if you have a problem of any kind doesn't have to do anything have doesn't have to have anything to do with my message it can have everything to do with it or it can be about anything because God cares about your cares could you bow your hearts with me in prayer father we love you today I thank you Lord God for what you've shown us real faith and walking with you can do And I thank you, you've shown us in these messages in the last two weeks, how you are a God over everything. You're God over this natural world. Father, you created it. You spoke it into existence. You have control over it. You have all authority over the supernatural world. You've shown yourself to have authority over disease and sickness and even over death. Father, there's nothing that we can fear that you haven't already conquered. So, Father, in times of our desperation and fear, I pray that you would remind us that you're walking with us every step of the way, that you want us to just keep walking with you. And I help you would, I pray that you would give us the confidence to know that even when our situation looks uh, desperate, out of control, that you're still in control. And if you're here today, maybe you're unsure of your status with God. Maybe you're a really good person, but you're not a saved person. Maybe you've had a religious experience, but you left it there. You're not walking in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, today. Maybe you're thinking about your life and you're wondering, if I died today, would I go to heaven? If you're not sure of that right now, you can be sure of that in one simple prayer. To open your heart to receive Jesus Christ into your heart to be Lord and Savior of your life. I want to close this service by inviting you all to pray with me this prayer to ask Jesus to come into your life. Because I believe with all of my heart, He's pulling hearts here today. And if you're already serving Him, He's pulling you to serve Him more, to draw closer to Him. But would you repeat this prayer with me? Lord, I give you my life. I admit I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on a cross, that He shed His blood for my sin, and that He rose from the dead for me. I turn from my sin. I turn from my past and I turn to you to be my Savior. I want you to live in my life as my Lord. Help me to live with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day.